Welcome everyone and thank you so much for being with us today on this Equinox Day for the first session of the Daylight Awareness Week. This is a public event organized uh, by the Daylight Academy and as uh, the program manager of this organization I have the great pleasure today to open this series of virtual talks. Before we start, let me just say a few words about what is the Daylight Academy. So the Daylight Academy is an international membership organization um, bringing together scientists from very different disciplines, architects, engineers, uh, artists, and actually all kinds of professionals uh, working uh, on daylight related topics. Um, our main goal is to encourage um, innovation and the emergence of new and creative research ideas in, uh, in daylight research, of course, uh, and we do that through an interdisciplinary approach. To do that, we organize conferences, uh, different kinds of meetings, and we also support uh, small projects. So small working groups where all these specialists can meet, can exchange and learn from each other. Another important goal of uh, the Daylight Academy is to disseminate the knowledge. Uh, all this knowledge that we have from these specialists, it's something that we would like to communicate uh, to create more awareness about these questions. And that's actually what we are doing today and what we would like to do through this entire Daylight Awareness Week. The subject of today's webinar is um, particularly topical at the moment, unfortunately. Um, our experts of the day will discuss with us the disinfection powers of daylight. So how can daylight be used to neutralize bacteria, neutralize viruses, and even to treat certain diseases? Um, before handing over to them, uh, I also would like to stress that this session is intended to be as interactive as possible. So as participants, you are an active part of this session and you will have different opportunities to get involved, you will see. Uh, but don't hesitate to share your thoughts, to ask all your questions to the speakers. You can do that at any time using the Q&A function that you can find at the bottom of uh, your screen. And after the talks, the, the moderator will go through the different questions and invite the speakers to answer to them. One advantage of the Q&A function compared to the chat, which is also available, is that you can also vote or like the question that you particularly, that you find particularly interesting. And I, I really invite you to use this function because the, the question with the most likes will be prioritized. So they will appear on the top and this will help the moderator. And that's why we really ask you to, to use this Q&A for your questions and not the chat. I also would like to mention that uh, this event has been organized with uh, the amazing support of a very creative consulting organization named SenseTribe. Um, we have with us today, Chun Stefano and Laura Krasi. Um, they will not be directly visible, but they will do the very important job of coordinating everything in the background and making sure that uh, all technical aspects work. We also have the chance to have a third member of SenseTribe, Marina Roa an extremely talented illustrator. She did, for example, all, all these images that we have for the event. And she will do what uh, they call um, visual harvesting. So that means she will be drawing during the session and uh, capturing the most important uh, aspect of the discussion. And uh, she will, uh, of course, also share these drawings with us at different moments and uh, at the end of the of the webinar. Um, to finish this presentation of, uh, of all this hosting team, I also am happy to mention also my colleague Marion Betizot uh, from the Velux Stiftung. She's also with us today and will help 
particularly the moderator with uh, the Q&A session. Um, another information for you, um, note that this webinar is being recorded and uh, live streamed on YouTube. And the video will of course be available on the Delect Academy website. So now I'm very happy to introduce the moderator of this session, which is Burkhard Koenig. Burkhard is a German chemist and professor at the University of Regensburg in Germany. And his uh, research interests revolve around the use of light in chemistry. He is also a member of the Delat Academy and even member of our steering committee. So we couldn't think of a better person to facilitate these exchanges today. And yeah, I wish you a very interesting and insightful session and work out, the floor is yours. Lydia, thank you very much for this very nice introduction. A warm welcome from my side to all participants of this uh, webinar. And, and it's my great pleasure to guide you through the program today, uh, where we will explore a not so, so well-known aspect of uh, what light can do for us. As Lydia mentioned, um, my name is Burka Koenig. I'm a member of the Dale Academy and I work in chemistry and I use light to drive chemical reactions. But life is, I think, a companion for everybody of us. Every day when the sun rises in the morning, there's light. And light, of course, brings to our daily life colors, vision, um, uh, many impressions on there. So it's essential for us, but it's also a great source of energy. I would say the ultimate source of energy. When you think about where the energy of light, life comes from, this is light harvested by plants uh, and any biological process on earth relies on this energy harvesting on there. Of course, we also know technical processes that harvest light energy like photovoltaics, or uh, solar thermi to harvest um, heat energy or wind energy as a secondary source on there. Today's seminar here will address a very different area. We will look what light can do for health. So how we can use light energy to kill bacteria, to fight germs. And I think this is of course particular as Lydia already mentioned in this year, a very, very important topic uh, for us. I'm therefore very, very happy to have three experts today here presenting different aspects of um, what light can do for health. And I welcome today Sarah Beck, um, who's joining us from the US, uh, Wolfgang Bäumler and Caroline Marke on there. Great having you here on the program on there. That's fantastic. As Lydia mentioned, we would like to have this program very kind of dynamic and interactive. That's important um, that you're not just listen. And therefore, please make use of the um, question and answer section. And I already see there is already the first question and we will come back to this uh, very soon. We will monitor the questions. And then as Lydia mentioned, we will kind of uh, pick some and then um, uh, address it to our uh, speakers. Use the Q&A question also during the talks when everything uh, we, we would like to address or you would like to highlight on there. Before we now start with the presentations, um, I would like to start with the interactive part with you. And um, we have a few questions to you as an audience. And to address these questions, we will not use the Q&A section of, this, uh, of, of the webinar tool here. We will use a slightly different tool and that's called a Mentimeter because we would like to have your impressions a bit more visual way. And um, here's the information that you need. Take your smartphone or any other device you have access to and go to menti.com, www.menti.com and use the code that is uh, shown here. This is 2136720. If you put uh, in this code, you will then see this question that we have here appearing on, this, on the screen on there and we are asking for your answer. What is the first word that comes to your mind when you think of daylight? Is this whatever morning or is this colors or is this sunrise or here comes the first answers and you see we get a lot of things 
circadian rhythm, of course, this must be a chronobiologist, no? um, having this um, intention on their health is definitely important. Happiness, I think that can become even a little bit bigger here on the screen on their um, outdoors, warm. What we see here, light is associated with many very positive things on there. We leave this ongoing and we may come back later to this question here, but I think it gives us already a very nice impression what our audience thinks about daylight. Let's move on to the next question that we have to you, because we would like to know what you know already about the methods of disinfection involving daylight. Just give us an idea if you are very familiar, extremely familiar, so you are the expert or you haven't heard about this, because this helps us um, to see uh, uh, who is listening and this helps also our speakers. So I see we have a very few experts. We have a few people who are interested to really learn more and some people in the middle know a little but would like to increase the knowledge. I think that's perfect for our um, as you are the perfect audience for this webinar on here. Let's move to the third and last question we have to you. What do you hope to get out of this session? Just give us a quick quote. That would help us to praise our expectation a little bit. New information, very good. Learn about something about sunlight. Yeah, okay. Overview of mechanism. Let's see if we get to that detail. Yeah. Learn about the potential of light. I think that is probably something we will definitely address and we will see here on there. Right. Good. A lot of expectations. And with this expectation, let's start with the program. And um, we start with our first speaker. And let me introduce Sarah Beck. Zara is joining us today from the US um, and she's an aerospace engineer and worked as a NASA flight controller. So oh, that sounds a fantastic CV. So I like this when I saw this. And um, very international person as a Fulbright fellow. She was in uh, working in Bangkok at the Asian Institute of Technology at uh, Switzerland, in Switzerland as a uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Science Technology at EVAC. And her interest changed a little bit from space engineering and controlling, I don't know, spaceships to water. So her key interest is water, particular clean water, and even more, how to get it clean with light. So we look very much forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks for this uh, wonderful introduction. And... Uh, and thanks to all of the attendees for participating as well. Uh, let me just share my screen and we'll get started. All right, so as uh, Dr. Koenig mentioned, yeah, I'm an environmental engineer and very interested in UV disinfection. So I'm excited to talk about how that plays a role in the disinfection power of daylight. I am calling in from Colorado, where we like to say that we have 300 days of sunlight a year. And uh, today on the equinox, about half of our day uh, will be in sunlight and, uh, and not cloudy today. I also wanted to mention that uh, although I'm affiliated with the University of Colorado, I will also be joining the University of British Columbia uh, soon as an assistant professor starting in 2021. So with that, We'll get started. I, I like to start with this slide because uh, as Dr. Koenig mentioned, I have a background in aerospace engineering and having worked on the International Space Station program. Uh, but there are a few other reasons. I like this slide because it gives us kind of a, a global perspective. And then it also has us thinking about uh, many different applications of light. And I find it very cool that we can use light to power a building or a space station, for example, but then we can also use it to inactivate microorganisms. So we can use it on this large scale application and then on a micro or molecular scale application. And uh, another reason why I wanted to start with this is because we're talking about daylight. So we're talking about sunlight 
And I wanted to get us thinking about sunlight at its source. And so this top image was taken from the space station of the sun and just wanted to introduce the, the thought that daylight is different in, in different environments and the spectrum that we see from the sun uh, outside of the Earth's atmosphere is different than what we see within the Earth's atmosphere and it's different in different regions of the Earth as well. So next I wanted to give an overview of UV light since the UV are the most effective rays when it comes to disinfection, the most effective part of the sun uh, for disinfection. Just wanted to explain the differences between the different types of, uh, of UV. And so we may hear about UVA and UVB uh, pretty frequently in everyday life. If you're buying sunglasses, for example, or if you're buying sunscreen, uh, you buy the kind that's protective against UVA and UVB radiation. And that's because these are the rays that cause uh, sunburns and, and also cause uh, skin cancers as well. And these rays are emitted by the sun and they also are the ones that can penetrate the Earth's atmosphere and reach the Earth's surface. So UVA, most of that reaches to the Earth's surface. Some of the UVB, uh, which has a higher energy, some of those rays are stopped by uh, the atmosphere, in particular by the ozone layer. And then there's another group of rays, the UVC, which we don't hear about as much in, in everyday life, um, but these are the ones that are very effective for water disinfection. So if you hear about UV disinfection at uh, a water utility, for example, uh, or if you use a SteriPen to disinfect water when you're hiking, uh, these are, are UVC rays. And those are also emitted by the sun, but get stopped by the Earth's atmosphere. So this uh, spectrum that I show in the bottom left, that shows you the different wavelengths from the sun that are both reaching the atmosphere and then that can be detected outside of it. So just a, a brief intro, uh, I'm always interested in how we learn uh, the things that we learn. So how did we learn that solar disinfection was, was effective to begin with? And it's fun to me to look back at some of these uh, very first studies where they showed this and to how people learned the things that we now take for granted. So the first study that, that I'm aware about is um, this one from Downs and Blunt. So this was in the late 1800s where two researchers from the UK uh, they took different test tubes of a sugary solution and put one in the sun and then one in the shade. And what they found is that over time, over the period about, of about a month, uh, the sugar solution that was placed in the sunlight, in direct sunlight, it didn't have any bacterial growth, whereas the ones that were placed in the shade did. They had bacteria and, and fungi that grew. So then they got more curious about what is it about the sun that causes this uh, bactericidal effect, this germ killing effect. And they did different experiments with uh, different uh, layers of colored glass screens or putting the test tubes in a, a glass box uh, with different colors of glass. And then what they found is that it was the UV rays, the blue and the violet, that were the most damaging. So fast forward about a century and we're able to take advantage of that for disinfection. Uh, some of the first practical studies, practical applications of solar disinfection, which is shortened to SOTUS, uh, some of that started in the 1980s and the, the 1990s with, with trials for using it as an effective method for water purification. So uh, this is um, a, a diagram that's used for a lot of SOTUS applications from the Center for Forable Water and Sanitation Technology. Um, but basically waterborne disease is a problem and about 800 million people around the world lack access to clean water. And this is one method that can be used amongst others uh, that can be used to, to disinfect water. It's been promoted by the World Health Organization for quite some time and also by the, the CDC for reducing the prevalence of diarrheal disease. So I wanna explain how this method works. First, I'd like to give a general overview, a uh, general and technical overview of how light-based disinfection works. So in general, when we're talking about light-based disinfection, so using light to disinfect water or surfaces, uh, there are two methods or two mechanisms that, that are used. And one is direct photolysis and the other is indirect photolysis. So what we're, what's happening here is you have a photon or a packet of energy from your light source, whether it's sunlight or from a human-made source like a lamp, 
And in the case of direct photolysis, that's directly breaking the bonds. So it's zapping your DNA or your RNA, or it's zapping the structure, whether it's your cell membrane or your virus capsid. Uh, the other method is indirect photolysis. So in this case, you have that photon or that packet of energy, it's hitting something else like a molecule that is then damaging your organism. So the light is indirectly damaging your organism. And those molecules can either come from within the organism or from outside of it. So all of this happens uh, along the, the spectrum part of the electromagnetic spectrum um, and the region that we call the germicidal region of UV light. Um, and germicidal meaning that it, it's killing the germs through, through different, um, different mechanisms. So first I'll talk in detail about the first one I mentioned, direct photolysis. And again, this is where the photons directly causing the damage. And this is part of my dissertation research actually. And, and this uh, particular experiment was from eight years ago. So time flies, but here we were taking a light source uh, from a laser. We had access to a laser where you could get the specific precise wavelength that you wanted. And then you could irradiate, you could expose your Petri dish with germs, with with viruses or with bacteria directly to that laser light. And then we, we analyzed what was happening to the DNA, what was happening to proteins. And what we found is that there are certain regions where uh, this protein damage happens, certain regions where DNA damage happens. And when you have DNA damage, that means the light is directly damaging the, the DNA or the RNA. It's breaking apart bonds and creating other bonds. And this is called a, a lesion. And I like to think of it as uh, analogous to a, a zipper, for example, and say, for example, you're, you have an organism that's trying to infect and to do that, it needs to replicate its DNA or its RNA. So you have this little enzyme that goes along and makes copies of those strands. Well, if it hits a region that's been damaged, then it can't continue past that region. So to me, that's sort of like you're trying to zip your winter coat and it gets stuck on a tooth that's been damaged. To me, this is kind of similar to how uh, the mechanism of direct uh, damage to DNA works. And like I said, this is, um, this is happening on the, so on the spectrum below 300 nanometers um, typically. So this isn't exactly the, the region that's being uh, emitted by the sun that reaches the earth's surface. But look, there's still some uh, just above 300 nanometers. So between 300, 305 nanometers, we've seen that type of, of DNA damage and, and those bonds being made. So this plays a role, but a very, very limited role in what's happening when you have um, exposure to sunlight. The dominant mechanism or the dominant method of why is daylight effective is from indirect photolysis. So this is where you have the sun, it's, uh, it's hitting a molecule and those molecules are damaging the membrane or the virus um, structure. And in this case, I, I like to think of it as you're creating oxidants. So we hear about antioxidants a lot. In this case, you're creating oxidants. So you're creating molecules that need an electron and they go stealing electrons from things like the membrane or the capsid and that damages your microorganism. And uh, that is why it's effective. So how can we use this? How, how do we use this and take advantage of these processes for, uh, for solar disinfection? Well, what we do or what you can do um, and what is promoted, especially in uh, communities in low to middle income countries uh, where the need to purify water is, uh, is urgent. Um, in these cases, you can fill a water bottle, um, a PET or polyethylene terephthalate, just a standard plastic bottle uh, with water and then expose it to direct sunlight for six hours or expose it if it's a cloudy day uh, for two days. And what you're trying to do is inactivate all, and all the organisms that are inside of that bottle, which could be viruses or bacteria, different protozoa, or even um, potentially helminth eggs. These are the, the organisms that cause uh, roundworm infections and are a big problem with them, um, with about one sixth of the Earth's population. So. Again, looking at these, uh, these wavelength rays and um, the different ranges and what's actually reaching the water inside the bottle. So I mentioned UVA, UVB, and UVC, UVA and B that are um, making it to the Earth's surface. Well, the UVA is making it into that water bottle, the UVB is not. Those rays, the ones that directly can damage some of the, the DNA or the structure, 
those rays are either are reflected or mostly absorbed by the plastic bottle, so they don't make it inside. But the UVA rays do, uh, so that's your dominant mechanism here. And then you also have visible rays, and you also have infrared rays. So what this means is that solar disinfection works basically with two, two ways or two different methods. One is a photochemical, it's creating those um, molecules that then uh, oxidize parts of the, the membrane or parts of the organism. It can, be, it can be the membrane, it can also be the DNA or RNA, but it's indirect, um, meaning that the light creates a molecule um, that then causes that damage. And then solar disinfection also works through the heat effect. And this is from the infrared rays that are getting inside that water bottle and warming the water up at least to 40 degrees uh, C. So how much exposure do we need? This depends on the, the microorganism or the virus of concern, and it's more effective. This method of SOTUS is more effective for bacteria than for other organisms. If we look at bacteria, these have E. coli and Vibrio cholerae, which causes uh, cholera. Uh, those you see are, are highly susceptible to solar light. So after six hours of direct a sunlight exposure, we get between 99% and 99.999% of uh, inactivation or of our E. coli of, of that bacteria, and even more when it comes to, uh, to cholera. If we're looking at Giardia or Cryptosporidium, so these are our organisms, uh, protozoan organisms you might hear about, uh, especially if you're hiking and buying the right water filter or a SteriPen uh, to sterilize your water when you're hiking. So these are actually pretty susceptible to solar disinfection as well, especially SOTUS. Uh, when we get into uh, SCARIS, that one that causes those roundworm infections, we need even more time. And then when we get to polio or norovirus, uh, we need even more time for inactivating those viruses. So the recommended amount of six hours of direct sunlight exposure isn't quite enough for the viruses, uh, which I can explain about a little bit more if, if people are interested. But for now, I wanted to mention, I'm sure uh, many people are interested in a human coronavirus, since this is the pathogen of concern worldwide right now that has uh, affected our society um, quite significantly. What about solar disinfection of human coronavirus? Um, and yes, so the one study that I'm aware of uh, where they looked at sunlight and human coronavirus uh, found that it was actually very effective. And I, I wanna clarify that this isn't looking at water in a bottle. This is just looking at a surface, for example. So if you're wondering if I have a mask or if I have laundry or something, groceries, and I want to put them in direct sunlight, how much time do I need? And what they found is that um, you can get 90% um, of the infectious virus inactivated after seven to 14 minutes. And again, I want to, um, I really want to mention, I saw one of the questions, the first question of the Q&A session asking about what about glass? How does that affect it? And it, it does have an effect. So I have a, a friend who, um, who works uh, in the ICU and he was telling me that he puts his N95 mask on uh, the dashboard to help disinfect it, to get, at UV, get the UV exposure. And, uh, and I mentioned that, that that could be a problem, or it is a problem because the sunlight that's the most effective, as we found, those rays will get absorbed by the, the windshield or by other glass. And the same way that we don't get sunburns uh, when we're in a car on long road trips, uh, we also don't get, um, get the exposure that we need if you're disinfecting something like a mask. So for that, it's better to have it in direct sunlight uh, in order to be effective. So a great question. And then uh, lastly, I, I wanted to talk about other applications of this uh, UV light-based disinfection. I mentioned mainly solar disinfection in this talk that's also used for constructed wetlands or for wastewater treatment ponds. Uh, and we're also looking at, at um, similar applications for aerosol disinfection. So working in the Hernandez lab at the University of Colorado, we have been looking at inactivating mouse coronavirus inside a, an air chamber that's about, I think, two and a half meter cube and, um, and doing that inactivation either by UV, either directly or indirectly. So lots of different applications. And with that, I'll say thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Oh, thank you very much for 
guiding us to these different uh, aspects and laying the foundation so that we all understand to, uh, how it works that light disinfects. And thank you also for answering already the first question during the talk. That was, uh, it's amazing, very good. There are quite a number of other questions. Um, let, me, let me just pick uh, two things that uh, I found into uh, that, that struck me here. The, um, there was one question that uh, there are studies also showing that microbes are affected by daylight in the visible range too. Um, what is the knowledge about this? How can um, visible light, so above 400 nanometers, also damage microbes? Sure, I would think that would happen in the same way, the indirect patholysis, so creating um, creating a molecule that then can directly or indirectly damage it. I would say that's what's happening there. And, mm -hmm. and it goes back to those first studies where they showed that damage was happening at different wavelengths, but the, the strongest damage was happening from the UV or from the blue light, stronger than from green or yellow, for example. Right, yeah. Another question that uh, addresses the, the SODIS uh, methodology, because you always use the PET bottles. And the PET bottles typically have UV absorbers in the plastic. So mm -hmm. to, to uh, last them longer. Um, is this affecting the whole process? Oh, definitely, definitely. And, and that's why the direct uh, damage to your organism doesn't happen because those rays are absorbed by the plastic. So that's definitely something to consider. That said, it's still better than if you, some people have asked me about using a glass bottle and that would absolutely not be effective. You need a, glass, a special type of glass that allows those rays to get through to your water. So mm -hmm. yeah, great question. Right, okay. Um, you mentioned the ozone layer as a protecting layer on there. What about the holes in the ozone layer? Do UVC pass through the ozone layer or is it only UVB? Because this is an excellent question. Yeah. And I wanted to look into that right before this talk, actually, <laughs> because I assume uh, obviously UVB would pass through it. I would assume there are issues with UVC as well, but I had been wanting to look into that and find out what has actually been measured in different regions, like in Antarctica, for example, different regions or parts of Australia where the, um, the damage, the ozone layer might be more significant. So I'm, I'm glad people are thinking along these lines. Right. Okay. What is the disinfection effect of light on the coronaviruses? What is the disinfection effect? Um, it depends which wavelength range you're talking about. So I wonder if that one came before, um, before I mentioned it. Um, but yes, so uh, seven to 10 minutes for 90% inactivation by sunlight. And then it's even much faster if you're able to use a UV source, like a LED or a mercury lamp, for example. So that's effective, no? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, it was mentioned a third way uh, of uh, disinfecting by simply increasing the temperature. So you also mentioned this, that, that the infrared radiation or the energy by light, the temperature effect is also of importance. When you look at these different effects, how important is the temperature effect in comparison to the, to the uh, reactive oxygen species and others? Oh, um... <laughs> Good question. I don't know if I could quantify that um, easily, except to say that um, even in studies where the temperature was kept constant or colder or below that 40 degrees Celsius, we still see um, a high inactivation. So, um, but it, obviously it helps. And then if you have both, if you have both the combination of the, the wavelengths that are doing the reactive oxygen, creating the reactive oxygen species and the temperature, when you combine the two of them above a certain temperature, you even get synergistic effects where um, you have more of an impact to your, your bacteria or virus than if you just have one or the other combined. Okay, so let me... Uh, have one one more question here. Does the power of disinfection reduce, increase depending on season and where one finds himself, herself in the world? I would assume yes, but maybe you can comment a little bit more. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a great one as well. And um, and wanted to mention that yes, of course, depending on where you are in the earth, uh, wh which latitude you're at, and then which season, how much. Um, sunlight you have. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important thing uh, for applications of solar disinfection. And it's also a challenging thing for researchers is how do you standardize that if you have someone doing experiments at 40 degrees latitude or someone in the tropics, the experience will vary. Um, so yeah, excellent point. Um, and something to, to take into consideration. Right.
thanks a lot for um, uh, the presentation and, and the discussion on there. Um, I would like you to uh, look in the, in the uh, question and answer session. Maybe you can answer a few of these things directly on there that we could not address here in, in detail. But we will come back and uh, discuss together with our other speakers at the end of the session the bit more global picture of things. Thank you for now and see you back soon. We move Thanks. on to our second talk and I welcome Wolfgang Bäumler. He is my colleague from the University Hospital uh, in Regensburg. And let's say untypical for um, um, to meet somebody with a physics degree in a hospital, but he is a physicist and works in a medical school. And his, um, his interest, he has many interests, of course, light and the impact of light on health, how to use light to improve health conditions. He has also one secret passion, and these are tattoos, not having them, but removing them by light. But this is not the topic of, the, of today. Today, uh, his topic will be on a photodynamic disinfection. Uh, and his research uh, has already made it to the market. Uh, so he's a co-founder of a company who is now already bringing products to use light, daylight, to disinfect uh, surfaces on the market. Wolfgang, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Burkert. Welcome from also from my side. Um, I just have to switch on my screen here to show you the first slide. Okay. Welcome everybody from my side here. Yes, thank you very much, Burkhardt, for the kind introduction. Yes, I'm a physicist, but I'm working together with a lot of other scientists here at the university. These are chemists, microbiologists, and also uh, uh, physicians here. Um, I would like to introduce you to you a new technology that is able to kill bacteria um, uh, with a light, with daylight, or with the assistance of daylight. And that's the reason why I call my talk here light disinfection of surfaces. Um, you, have, you have already heard a lot of uh, different stories about uh, microorganisms, which you can divide in bacteria, in fungi, and last but not least, as everybody knows right now, uh, the so-called viruses, uh, small particles, highly infective. Uh, the coronavirus was already mentioned here uh, in, in, this, in, the, in the previous talk. And the photodynamic technology was developed in the last few years to um, kill bacteria uh, regardless of their type, gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive bacteria, virus, fungi, uh, resistant, bacterial resistant to antibiotics or not. Uh, photodynamic inactivation uh, makes right now a good job, but I don't want to bring you uh, the whole story. Uh, uh, I would like to focus on a special technology, uh, killing bacteria on env environmental surfaces, on environmental inanimate surfaces. We have microorganisms, a lot. we are surrounded by microorganisms and uh, some of them are our friends and some of them are our enemies. And uh, the enemies are the pathogenic uh, germs, the pathogenic uh, microorganisms. And you can find them on our skin, uh, you can find them in wounds, and, uh, but you can also find a lot of microorganisms uh, on environmental surfaces because we touch surfaces with our skin we are coughing on on unintentionally on surfaces and then we have bacteria and viruses and um, and also fungi on those surfaces as you may know if you go to an hospital some sometimes people are a little bit afraid of getting such uh, pathogenic uh, microorganisms and uh, uh, getting a disease of, out of them, which are then called nosocomial infection. That means an infection which is acquired in an hospital. And once you look at uh, 
different items here in, in such a room, you won't see those microorganisms. The reason for that is they are so small, even if you put a, a magnifying lens on that, you won't see them. And uh, so you need something special. You need an, an, a microscope, uh, something like a, a, an electron microscope, which can magnify those uh, microorganisms sufficiently so you can see them. And what you can see here are so-called Staphylococcus aureus on a, on a surface. And you can see the small uh, droplets here. These are the germs and they are so small, around about one micron in diameter. Uh, and that's the reason why you don't see them, but they are present. And we know that uh, infections are transmitted through such surfaces. So one uh, individual is, is, is touching the, the, the surface, uh, spreading the, the germs on the surface and the next who is touching the same area or the same surface again is taking the, uh, um, the germs uh, uh, and this is the way uh, those pathogenic microorganisms can spread from one person to the next. And these are some examples uh, uh, like bacteria, you may know them, Staphylococcus aureus, for instance, the, uh, the method methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, uh, which is, I think the shortcut is well known, the MRSA. And we have also uh, the gram negatives, the E. coli, the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Then we have the viruses. If you get a flu, then you have the influenza virus. Uh, and if you have some gastrointestinal problems, then you have the norovirus. And uh, yes, for sure, uh, well known right now, the SARS-CoV-2 and all, also many others. Also fungi are, can be pathogenic like Candida albicans, Candida auris, and also Aspergillus fumigatus. So if you look at the surface, not only in the hospital, but maybe also on other surface outside hospitals, you can see that over time, uh, due to the touch of those inanimate surfaces, uh, germs can settle there and, and increase in number, as shown by this graph, yeah, due to the uh, content, contamination of the, uh, of the surfaces, the number of microorganisms is increasing. Then hopefully somebody is showing up, uh, cleaning the surface with uh, disinfectants, and then the number is decreasing. But it is clear that uh, contamination occurs again. Uh, and cleaning again, contamination again. So it's always this, the same story that it's always a fight against those microorganisms on such surfaces. And it depends on how much time is in between two, um, uh, two disinfection cycles. It may last hours or even days, depends on the surface, depends on the location. Uh, uh, whether these numbers of microorganisms are, are, are reduced to, to a number which is not, uh, which is not, yeah, that the number is not able to, uh, uh, to, to cause an, an, a transmission of, of those germs from one person to the next. So keeping the, the, the number of microorganisms as low as possible on such surfaces, I think this is a very important goal. So how to do that? So because you, can do uh, or you can reduce the, the time span, yeah? let us say from a few hours to a few minutes. So you wipe or you disinfect the surfaces every minute. And as you can understand, this is time consuming, this is impractical and uh, uh, it does mean a, a lot of costs. So th this is not really practical. So that's the reason why we had found another solution and uh, we developed uh, on a scientific base, first of all, a so-called antimicrobial coating, which efficiently inactivates the microorganisms on these coatings, uh, thereby on the surface, which acts not from time to time, so every hours or every day, but it acts continuously and it acts autonomously and creating something like a so-called self-sanitizing self effect. What should the coating uh, deliver? It should not use hazardous substances, should not use hazardous procedures. And uh, for sure, uh, as you may know, it should, uh, we have a lot of antibiotic resistance uh, in the world. It should not, as a new technology, it should not again 
contribute to the antibiotic resistance of bacteria. And for sure, it should not harm uh, the environment uh, uh, because if you coat a lot of surfaces, it should be clear that this substance uh, or this technology does not harm the environment. So come back to the daylight. Yeah? What we are using is the so-called photodynamic principle. Um, first of all, you start with visible lights, with photons, with photon energy. Visible light, as you may know, already explained in the previous talk, is the spectral range from 400 to 700 nanometers. Um, and uh, this daylight is, or the energy of this daylight, or the energy of those photons is absorbed in a special but harmless dye molecule. And then the energy is transferred from this uh, dye molecule to oxygen, to normal oxygen, which, which is surrounding you, which you are breathing. And due to this energy transfer, the oxygen is uh, activated to a highly activated state, which is called the so-called singlet oxygen. Singlet oxygen is simply a part of uh, the reactive oxygen species. And you may ask, okay, why do we not, why do we need this, this dye molecule in between? Why do we do not only use the daylight and using the daylight activating the oxygen? The problem is from a physical point of view, this does not work. So we need that transformer, this catalyst, which uh, uh, converts the daylight or the photons, uh, uh, photons energy of the daylight uh, to activate uh, this oxygen. And it is, it is an advantage that because if the presence of the, the, the dye molecule, where the dye molecule is located, there you can also uh, create those singlet oxygen. So oxygen on its own is, is reactive, everybody knows that. And But if you put some energy uh, uh, towards this oxygen, then you have uh, a, a very high or highly reactive uh, uh, oxygen molecule, which then attacks uh, the microorganisms, the biomolecules of the of the of the of the microorganisms, such as the proteins or the lipids uh, of the membrane of those organisms. We have three components in photodynamic inactivation of of, of, of microorganisms, which are harmless on its own. First of all, the visible light. We have uh, wavelengths between. 400 and 500 nanometer in, in our case. This light is absorbed in special dye molecules. They are based on vitamin derivatives, on plant ingredients and curcumins. And the third one in, the, in, the, in, in, in this theater is the normal aerial oxygen, which you can also breathe. So all of them are alone or harmless but the combination, uh, that's important. So if you combine those three components, then you can uh, generate uh, this antimicrobial single oxygen molecules, which really quickly causes oxidative damage of microorganisms. And where the, where the dye molecules are located, for instance, on the coating, um, there the single oxygen is produced. So you have only an on-site uh, production of singlet oxygen to kill the bacteria or the viruses or the fungi which are sitting on, on the surface or on this coating. Yes, by the way, um, the pho this photodynamic principle is, is, is rather safe because it is now used for more than 25 years in medicine to treat tumors and other diseases. How does it work on the surface? So let me show this uh, small scart here. Uh, you have a any surface like glass, plastic, metal, so any surface material from a desk, from, from a bed, bed rails, or what, something like that. And then you coat it with a very thin uh, lacquer or coating, a few microns is enough. Um, and inside this coating, you have the dye molecules. Although there are dye molecules, this, this coating is rather invisible. And once the, the, the microorganisms are settling uh, on the surface, uh, and the daylight is present, the singlet oxygen is generated by uh, this dye molecules in the coating and the singlet oxygen is escaping, is escaping uh, this uh, coating is uh, uh, in 
encountering the, the microorganisms and they are killing the microorganisms directly on the surface. And as long as the light, daylight, room light, LED in the visible part of the spectrum doesn't matter, uh, the photons uh, are in this in this order the photons are required in, in the spectral region from 400 to 500 or 550 nanometers and as you can see here again an electronic uh, microscope image this is a damaged uh, uh, staphylococcus aureus which is uh, then uh, killed uh, or which is dying afterwards so one can say simply if daylight or uh, room light is, is falling on such a specially coated surface, then singlet oxygen is generated in the coating and escaping and killing the microorganisms which are settling on that surface. You can do that on any surface and uh, the big advantage is you can do it as a lacquer or you can also apply it uh, retroactively so uh, you can wipe it on. This, this, this coating, you can wipe it on any surface and then once it is, it is dried after one or two hours, then you have uh, this um, coating, which then acts uh, entry uh, against uh, against uh, uh, different microorganisms. The big advantage is that you only excite them on site. That means uh, you have it only there where the micro where, where, where the dye molecules are present in the coating, and. The singlet oxygen shows a rather short diffusion length, which is uh, um, the diffusion length is, 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 is sufficient to reach all the microorganisms, which are very tiny, very small, but uh, which is not too far so that you have only one millimeter above the surface, uh, this reactive oxygen species. So you have nothing left in the room or left in the, in the environment. So it's uh, a very limited, but very efficient process. So we do not need any toxic or mutagenic substances. Uh, you don't uh, need UV light. We, we use only the normal uh, daylight, room light. Um, it also works on dry surfaces because singlet oxygen is a gaseous molecule, which can easily reach uh, even if the, the microorganisms are stacked on the surface. And um, Yes, uh, uh, there is no resistance against singlet oxygen, for instance, with bacteria. And uh, we have also tested that not only in the laboratory, but also under real life conditions. This I want to show you in the next two slides. Yes, we tested this new technology. It seems to be like a, a, a nice idea, but uh, um, so we have to test it, whether it really works. Yeah, thin lacquer, a thin coating, is killing bacteria, is killing viruses, or uh, um, those uh, fungi. So what we did is uh, we did we, we coated different surfaces uh, and loaded them with different pathogenic bacteria and viruses and fungi. I just show you some results from bacteria to compare the, photo, the, the pure photodynamic effect. So we used an active coating which contained the dye molecule, and then we compared that with an inactive coating. Uh, the same coating, but with, without uh, dye molecules. So we have no generation of singlet oxygen in this coating. And the difference then is, is then caused by singlet oxygen, um, which kill the microorganisms. If you count them uh, on both uh, inactive and active, then you can uh, uh, yeah, express the result as a uh, reduction of viable bacteria, which is simply caused by photodynamically uh, generated singlet oxygen. As you can see here, yes, if, if you assist the normal daylight with an LED visible light, then you can achieve the, 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 the very good effect within 10 minutes, a reduction uh, by 99.99%. But if you switch to normal daylight indoor for seven hours, then you get more or less the same result. So it's very interesting uh, that you can speed up a little bit. If you use uh, more light intensity in a room, you can a little bit speed up the, the process. In the same investigations, we also did a field study. So in the laboratory, you can always provide some evidence for some effects, but we won't like to test that under real life conditions. So we brought this two new technology uh, to uh, two hospitals here in Regensburg, 
um, for, and tested for one year. So we used surfaces in those hospitals with show the frequent touches. Again, one part is, is or one desk or one uh, room is coated with an active uh, coating and the other one is coated with an inactive coating just to show the difference whether bacteria killing or virus killing or fungi killing is really due to the photodynamic effect by comparing those results. Here we, did, we um, detected the, the um, um, or we measured, quantified the effect by counting the bacteria per square centimeters, which are sitting uh, uh, on the surface. We use different rooms in the two hospitals, like the emergency room or the wards or the, the ambulance. Yes, and we at the end of the day, we had more than 1,000 samples. Uh, uh, half of them are from the active coating, the other half of the are from the inactive coating. And what we found, uh, um, that the inactive coating, so under normal conditions in a normal hospital, we had more than six uh, bacteria per square centimeters. With a photodynamic effect, we could reduce that uh, uh, significantly to less than two uh, bacteria per square centimeters. So come back to coming back to this to this to this figure. Uh, this is the normal situation, but uh, we know that there is a benchmark which. Uh, uh, which, which, which says that if 2.5 bacteria per square centimeters, or you have more than 2.5 bacteria per square centimeters, so your nosocomial infection in a hospital will increase. And uh, with this coating in, in this study, in this field study, we could uh, uh, decrease the number of bacteria below this benchmark. And uh, simply to that uh, coating, which continuously and autonomously uh, kept the bacteria uh, as small as possible. What is the benefit if you reduce the, the load or the count of the, of the microorganisms on a surface? Usually, if you have a lot of bacteria or, or microorganisms on a surface, you, one hand is touching them, the other one is touching uh, this, this next, and then you transmit the germs through, the, through your hands or other items. Uh, if you have less bacteria on the surface, then the transmittance is reduced. And uh, we hope that uh, in this case, the, the, the frequency of nosocomial infection is also decreasing. And uh, this may uh, help to or assist to reduce uh, infections uh, uh, in human beings. And for sure, this coating is not only usable uh, uh, inside uh, hospitals or inside healthcare settings, it can be also used outside uh, 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 healthcare settings. And uh, uh, yeah, actually we know all the problems with, uh, with the coronavirus and it's uh, still a debate going on whether the surfaces uh, are uh, viable or not viable, but infectious uh, uh, viruses are transmitted through inanimate surfaces. But uh, we know that also viruses are killed in below enveloped viruses such, such as the SARS-CoV-2 are uh, uh, inactivated by those coatings. Yes, Ooh. this is, was my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, Wolfgang, thank you for the presentation. Um, we have already some pressing questions and let me yep. address this one. How long does the coating last? Uh, we the, the 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 study was running for 12 months, and in this 12 month, uh, the coating was still present and still working with the same efficiency. Okay, good. And there was is already a link to the first talk. Do you have already these dye fox co coated? Have you, do you have bottles to use visible light to disinfect water? Would that be possible? Uh, Yes and no. Uh, I, I simply talked about the surface coating, and um, the problem is if you have a, a bottle with one liter uh, uh, fluid inside, um, so the germs are, are, are swimming in, 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 in the liter, so they have to, to pass to the surface where the singlet oxygen is produced. There is a way, or there's an, there's, there's, there's an idea uh, to add those molecules, which, because they are uh, flavins, they are uh, curcumins and so on. So you can also add such uh, dye molecules, they are water soluble. You can add them to, to any water, to any fluid. And then since the, since the dye molecule are positively charged, they attach to the negatively charged surface of the microorganisms. And then once light is shining on, 
singlet oxygen or any other reactive oxygen species are killing the bacteria. Perfect. So we have to move on because we only have a little time. Thank you very much for sharing. You're welcome. Information. Um, at this point, we would like to have a quick look at the visual harvesting because Marina is while the talks are ongoing and we look at the questions to draw some visual harvesting and you see it here, at least on my screen, it's on the upper left corner where she made some small, uh, some, some, yeah, uh, grasp some visual visuals from all the talks. We will come back to this after the next talk and then Marina will also tell us uh, what kind of visual harvesting uh, uh, she brought together and explain us a little bit uh, what was uh, on, on, on her impression uh, um, worth to put it on paper on there. At that point, I would now like to move on to our third and last presentation for today. And this will bring us into the clinic again to treating hospital, uh, to treating patients. And I welcome Karolina Marke from the Institute of Anatomy of the University of Zurich. There she develops clinical therapies using light, um, particularly also treatment of cancer patients with photodynamic therapy. She's a passionate teacher and I look forward to hear uh, about the photodynamic therapy on there. So that will be the last talk for today using light uh, in, in these clinical applications. Carleen, we're looking forward to your presentation. So thank you very much, Borkert. I am trying to share my screen now. OK, I hope it's visible. So um, first of all, hello, everybody. And from, from now, well, rather cloudy Zurich. Well, from the previous presentations, we have already learned a lot about the amazing power of light to kill microbes on, on surfaces and, and in water. So basically the next logical question would of course be how about treating patients with light? Well, in fact, the idea to cure the sick with the, with the sun is quite old. We have records from ancient times for that. So phototherapy has a long history. It is often based on the strong uh, effects of UV uh, spectrum, of the UV spectrum of, of sunlight, as Sarah uh, explained in, in her first talk. However, uh, what I'm going to present you in the next 10 minutes or so is a modality that exploits the visible part of the spectrum. So lower energy compared to UV. And it also, includes a drug. So it is more than just phototherapy. The method is called photodynamic therapy or PDT. And its principle has many overlaps uh, with what you have just heard before from uh, Wolfgang Bäumler for the surface treatment, this photodynamic inactivation. However, in patients, uh, the reactions that take place are much complexer because you have the biological environment of the human body, and this requires specific considerations. So now, question is, how can I switch, go to the next one? No, okay, sorry, this is too much. So now how does PDT works? As you can see here, PDT starts with a light sensitive drug, the photosensitizer, you have heard this term before. These are just two examples of uh, photosensitizer molecules. There are many around. So depending on the disease to be treated, the photosensitizer can be applied locally, for example, as a cream, but it also can be used systemically. So in this cartoon here, the patient apparently suffers from a cancer and the photosensitizer is injected intravenously mostly and distributes all over the body, as you can see here in this picture. So it distributes all over the body to all organs and tissues. Uh, the photosensitizer is here marked in, in red. So in contrast to, for example, chemotherapeutics, such a wide distribution is not a big problem since in a large dose range, these photosensitizers are simply non-toxic. You have already heard that from the previous talk. So non-toxic, at least as long as the patient stays in the dark. 
So after application of uh, such a photosensitizer, the patient has to strictly avoid uh, the light to not get a sunburn because of the photosensitizer accumulating in the skin or in the eyes. So now comes an important point for you to understand. After a while, after the so-called drug light interval, the photosensitizer is mostly cleared from healthy organs, while it has a tendency to stay, to remain in the cancer. And this preferential accumulation of the photosensitizer in cancer cells can be exploited for diagnostic purposes because the photosensitizers are fluorescent. And this method is called photodynamic diagnosis or PDD in short. However, if illuminated with a specific wavelengths in the visible range, so visible light, a cascade of oxidative uh, oxidative processes are initiated in exactly this region, and this is PDT. What happens then is shown here on the right hand side. You have already seen, um, well, kind of this graph here in a simplified form from the previous talk from Wolfgang. And don't worry, I don't want to go into detail here. This so called Jablonski diagram is just here to, uh, to show you and to illustrate that different and very complex simultaneous reactions take place. And they are inducing, uh, well, they are actually induced after this, this light, light uh, illumination of the photosensitizer. Basically energy from the incoming light uh, is transformed or transferred via the photosensitizer to uh, oxygen. Wolfgang also mentioned that. Um, and this oxygen, of course, is present in the tissue. So oxygen is the, the third necessary component um, in PDT beside the photosensitizer and the visible light. So the end product of these reactions then are very aggressive. You have already heard that. And the oxygen species immediately attack various cellular targets, which are in the neighborhood of these species. So the cells actually do have protective mechanism against that, but the aim of PDT is to overwhelm them. If this occurs, the cells die and the patient is cured as depicted here. So this is the principle of PDT as a direct cancer killing modality. But PDT may also generate two additional indirect anti-cancer effects in patients. And this may be probably as important as these primary effects for, for the treatment success. So on the one hand, the blood supply as depicted here in this right-hand picture, the blood supply to the tumor may be damaged by PDT. So the cancer may be just deprived from nutrients and basically is starved to death. And on the other hand, it had been observed at least that the immune system may be activated by PDT and this may lead to a systemic uh, immune reaction against the cancer, probably a bit uh, like, like, a, like a vaccine, at least in part. So this is very exciting and not yet fully explored actually. Okay, this was the, the heart uh, biochemical physical um, part of my talk and I will now shortly show you some pictures from PDT and from our lab. I'm actually not seeing patients, I'm more in the basic scientific field, so I'm showing you here some pictures from cell cultures and look how, how beautiful these photosensitizers are. These are examples with different cancer types and all the red, red fluorescence is due to the photosensitizer within the cancer cells. I have also a short video to share with you. I hope it works. It was rec uh, recorded without uh, the fluorescence mode. So the red uh, photosensitizer is not visible in this case, but you will see the effects of PDT. So starting point here is a cell culture with many, many, many cancer cells densely packed as a monolayer. But you will quickly see that PDT will cause them to detach and well, basically to explode within a few hours. So I'm trying to start. I think it works. So this is how it looks. 
PDT looks in a time lapse in cell culture, but basically it would look very similar and uh, in, in the body in, in another environment. So the cells are basically all detaching and they are killed. So um, as a treatment for cancer patients, PDT has many, many advantages over the standard therapies, such as surgery or chemotherapy or radiotherapy. I've summarized the most important ones here on, on the left-hand side of the slide. So if, uh, as you have already seen, PDT is non or minimally invasive. It is strictly focused on the region exactly where you put the light. And because of that, it is basically has no or well, very limited side effects and patients recover quickly and excellent outcomes have been reported. Actually here on the left-hand side is an example of one of the earliest anti-cancer PDT applications. It is from 1905, it is mentioned somewhere here, here it is. And have a look, the skin cancer, which is here at the lip and at the nose is just gone here at this side. Imagine with the surgical treatment, parts of the lips and the nose would have been dissected, just cut out. Think about consequences for this poor patient for eating and breathing and look at this effect and this result. Okay, also PDT is non-mutagenic and can thus be repeated several times without the risk uh, for the patient. And no resistance to PDT has been reported. In addition, the PDT principle can be applied to basically all types of cells. So it has a really broad application spectrum and it can be combined with other therapies because there is no interference now. Well, sounds fantastic, right? The reason that you may probably not have heard about this PDT is that it is not a general routine method in the oncology clinics it would take probably too much time to explain the reasons why this is the case. But from the previous slides, you might have at least an impression that the, the, the complicated interplay of the photosensitizer, the light, the oxygen, in turn also in, in the interplay with the different tissue compartments in the body are really difficult to control. So in practice, it can be a real challenge to adjust all these different steps to achieve the desired effect. So there's still a lot of research necessary. However, in the, in the following, I will show you three selected examples of clinically used PDT. Since I'm aware that the seminar is on the disinfection power of light, I will skip the very successful or very promising anti-cancer related PDT applications. Actually, you may have already wondered whether photodynamic principles can also be used for the treatment of infections in patients. The answer is actually yes, and Wolfgang has already shortly mentioned that. But as opposed to the anti-cancer PDT, the antimicrobial applications are even less developed for patients yet. However, especially in view of the alarming rise of bacteria that are resistant to all sorts of, of antibiotics, photodynamic medicine gains more and more attention. Actually, I, I, I have to say regain attention because Ironically, the origins of antimicrobial photodynamics also date back to more than 100 years ago. In fact, the first photodynamic experiments in modern medicine were antimicrobial. They had been performed by a person named Oskar Raab, who was a medical student at the University of Munich, where he investigated uh, the effects of, of certain dyes on singlet uh, on single cell organisms. So one day, the story says, he left his, all his experiments on paramecia unattended at the window while he was at, at, at the uh, Oktoberfest. He did not know that the dyes he used on his cells were light sensitive. They were what we now know uh, they are photosensitizers. However, uh, a storm, a thunderstorm uh, approached suddenly and by chance the lightning 
activated the dye in his cell cultures and basically all his paramecia were killed. Well, actually, I do not know whether the story is really true, but honestly, a beer party as a starting point for great science is just very nice, I think. So what first looked like an, like an accident quickly turned out as, as a breakthrough uh, experiment, which gave rise to a first short but very productive uh, scientific era of PDT at the beginning of the 20th century. However, especially the impressive antimicrobial potential of photodynamics, they were quickly forgotten when penicillin and other antibiotics had been discovered. But as mentioned, antibiotics suffer from resistance of, of a growing number of, of pathogens, and thus alternative therapies are urgently needed. And this is where antimicrobial PDT re-entered the stage. Consequently, there is now a huge, still mostly preclinical PDT research on that. And impressive results have already been published for a number of bacteria, even antibiotic resistant ones, fungi, virus, parasites, everything, all microbes. And here actually in the background to finish this slide off is a photo also from our lab where you can see a red fluorescent photosensitizer attaching to, to chains of streptococci. Okay, in the next slides, I will now briefly show you three selected clinical examples of antimicrobial PDTs, so in patient settings. Here in patients, the aim is not to kill the diseased tissue, like, like in the cancer treatment I've shown you before, but to destroy the causative pathogen and at the same time modulate the, the patient system to recover from the damage caused by these uh, microbes. So my first example is from a Chinese study. As I said, I'm not working with patients, so I'm just citing here uh, publications which are available and you see also the references here on the, on the lower side of, the, of this, uh, the slides. So my first sample is from a Chinese study where sunlight was used as the light source. And in this case for, B, uh, for, for patients with severe acne. Interestingly, it had been shown that protocols with sunlight um, give a better result than with lasers because lasers are often uh, prone to generate a very strong pain sensation in these type of patients. So, but look at uh, the results here now. This is before and this is after the treatment and they look quite positive. The success rate uh, of this treatment is based on killing of the propioni bacteria, which are causing these local inflammations you see here in the face, plus a destruction of the sebaceous glands in the skin that are home to these bacteria. So this was already my first example. The next is from a patient with a non-healing wound that was super infected with different bacteria. Often bacterial biofilms are found in such wound lesions and they are very difficult to treat, especially when antibiotic resistant strains are present. However, PDT may be an interesting option for such patients. As you can see here, the patient could really completely cure it. How, look how good the result is. So my last clinical example deals with antimicrobial PDT applications in a different but also microbe loaded part of the body. And this is the oral cavity, so the mouth. Actually, PDT in dentistry is actually a very active research field. Here it is used for periodontitis, a disease that is associated with the loss of uh, the supporting tissue around the teeth due to different pathogens residing in pockets under the gingiva, under the gum, so around here. Obviously, it looks like a challenge to reach such a site of infection and to apply light here. However, as you can see, special tools have been developed to solve this problem. Here, the photosensitizer, which is actually green in this case, is introduced with a needle-like instrument. And there are also tiny, tiny instruments to apply the light, light fibers, basically. 
And as you can see here, the PDT works under these conditions. The microbiological tests show that bacteria can be efficiently removed. This is before and this is after the treatment. So I'm already finally at the end of my presentation. The clinical applications shown here were really just a very few examples out of a, a, a wealth of literature available. It was actually not so easy to, to show the most interesting uh, and illustrative pictures and, and cases. Anyway, um, I hope I just have, sorry, I have just one slide. Can I have it back? It's just, oh, okay, now it is. So um, I hope that I could convincingly show you that photodynamic processes that integrate actions of per se harmless components like photosensitizer, light oxygen are excellently suitable for uh, the local elimination of cells, including solid cancer cells or microbes, all in a safe and efficient way and also in patients, not only on surfaces as we have seen before. Since its mode of action is actually fundamentally different, no, I cannot move it forward. Yeah. So the actions are fundamentally different from standard known therapies. And since it, the method attacks multiple biological targets at the same time, it can be used for diseases that currently lack a specific therapy or where current methods fail, for example, because of resistance. However, it should be clear that PDT cannot do magic. It's not a magic bullet that cures all and, and everything. The underlying biochemical and biophysical processes are very complex, as I have tried to show you, in part still they are in part still poorly understood and they have specific and also inherent limitations. Okay, I'm aware that my presentation contained a lot of information for such a short seminar form. And sometimes I was probably a bit driven away by the fascination uh, for this method. So I thank you all for staying till the end. And I'm of course happy to take your questions. Yeah, Caroline, thank you very much for giving us the insight in the medical use of light and the treatments. Uh, there was one question that came up during the talk here from our audience. When you administer the photodynamic uh, dyes on there, how long does it take for them to clear from the body? So you mentioned the point that when it's administered, the patients are light sensitive, but also in the last examples, um, is there any, any knowledge about this, how long they stay in the, in the body? Yes, of course. I mean, this is a very, very important point because it indicates how long the, the patient has to be out of the sun uh, and to stay inside uh, in, in, in without sunlight exposure. So this is a lot, of, there's a lot of, of studies on that, but it strongly depends on the photosensitizer. Mm -hmm. So some sort of photosensitizers, which are very effective, they have a very, very slow clearance rate. And so the patients have to stay inside for a very long time, but some are much quicker. So it depends on the photosensitizer. And of course, um, the idea is to have this uh, drug light interval in an in a acceptable range that the patient does not have too long way to, to wait full, uh, too long, but also uh, that it is not, the, it doesn't have to wait forever. Right. Yeah, so that's a therapeutic window. No, you have to address okay. the body. Right. So I would now like to invite also uh, Marion to come here on, on stage on there because we would like from uh, the questions that came up during all three talks, would like to select, uh, let's say, one or two aspects. And maybe uh, both parents are also join us here for the short panel discussion. <laughs> in a way. So Marion, what question do you think is the most pressing one that came up? Yes, yeah, so I think I think first the speakers for answering uh, during the talks different questions. So we have like 33 questions that's been answered for the talk. And there's one that I thought could be also interesting uh, to have the different aspects from different speakers. And it's actually about disinfection in surfaces where there's quite a few people. For example, schools where you have frequent contacts with um, 
uh, with the surfaces. So would um, the diffrox be here very helpful? How could we best make use of daylight and somehow make those places as safe as possible? Okay, I will answer that. I'll try to answer that very shortly. Um, yes, this coating is, is, can be applied to more or less any surface. And uh, usually this is applied, let us say, in the evening where nobody is in the room and this will dry for after one or two hours. And then this surface is working for the, at least for the next 12 months. And, uh, it, and then it is, it, is, it is important that light, daylight, room light, light through the window, doesn't matter, green, blue photons uh, are important uh, because they are absorbed by the dye molecules in the surface and creating the oxygen species. And uh, so wherever the light is coming from, from the, from, from the light bulbs or from the, through the window or, or uh, other normal room light, uh, it makes the job and is reducing permanently autonomously uh, the, the 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 bacteria the, the fungi and the virus on the surface so it's an it's an it's an uh, automatically running uh, process and nobody has to take care of that that's the that's the important uh, 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 you know story behind this technology maybe i can follow up directly on this one because i saw on some of the questions that came up is it what is better to use sunlight so daylight or uh, just an led maybe i direct the question here to our engineer <laughs> so, so what do you think is this is, is leds is artificial lightning and and uh, a good adequate because there were also the question what do i do if i have to disinfect in an area of my house where there's no sunlight yeah, I think um, Dr. Baumler answered that one in, in the questions in the Q&A that um, as long as the photon, photons are in the right wavelength range, then the, they will be effective. And uh, there's definitely a lot of uses for LEDs. Right. Okay, so LEDs would kind of uh, are a good replacement where there is no sunlight. Uh, sure, we can use that. No? And then there was one more question. The more general is how the light and the disinfection is also reflected then by the immune system of, of so, so more the holistic picture on there. Any comments on this? Yeah, the diversity of the, of the microorganisms is always changed by any measure. So uh, whether you use alcohol for disinfection or you use heating. Uh, so I think this process is always running since hundreds of years. And so the microorganisms are adapting to those uh, mechanisms. And uh, I think the, the, the best known adapt, adaption is the adaption to antibiotic uh, drugs uh, that, the, that is, for instance, the bacteria get resistant against them. So there's always a, a, a coming and a going and an adaption, and there's always an influence into, to, towards the towards our guests, let, let's call them guests, so bacteria, viruses, and, and fungi. There's always a pressure on them and, and they will always react. And, and don't forget the immune system because the immune system has a lot of uh, uh, measures to fight against bacteria for, for, for thousands of years. And for instance, it's very amazing that uh, the generation of, of reactive oxygen species is one of the major part of the of, of some immune cells fighting against uh, um, fighting against microorganisms. So they also they also producing, uh, by the way, not with light, <laughs> but chemically they are producing uh, a reaction, reactive oxygen species, the so-called oxidative burst, the so-called neutrophils are doing that, and they are uh, the, the, the neutrophil immunic cells. They are taking care of our health uh, uh, every in the everyday life. So they use the same strategy in principle. Yeah. Good, Mario. Any last thought we could briefly discuss here before moving on? Maybe one question. Going back to the medical uh, medicine side, um, there was one question about wound healing and how to use daylight without photosynthesizing molecules. If it's any if there are any possibilities in there, maybe to Caroline Macke. So um, do I understand it correctly? Uh, it is, the question was regarding sunlight without photosensitizers. 
Yes. Yeah. As we get bone healing. Yeah. So this is, yeah. I mean, it has been used long, long, for a long time, actually. Also before the time, the time before photosensitizers were really well known or defined as, as photosensitizers. Um, of course, also, uh, I mean, there are many treatments where, where plant-derived photosensitizers has been used before the term photosensitizer had been, had been defined. But uh, of course, also the sun appears to, to um, interact with the, with the immune system and therefore may also help to, to combat some, some infections. Um, again, it had been used just that people were exposed to the sun and that uh, this helped to, to close wounds. This was used before, I think, even in the World War I or something. I'm not, not absolutely sure, but this has been used in times where, uh, where other treatments were not available. So this is, had been used before. Okay, thanks a lot. We don't have, unfortunately, too much time. We could talk the whole evening, probably. But now we have to move on to Marina, and I invite her to uh, share with us and explain briefly her visual harvesting. Marina, all yours. Hello, can you hear me? Sure. Um, let me show you. I will share my screen as well. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Fantastic. Okay, so I started with this image just talking about solar disinfection. I was making a little metaphor on like a, a spray because actually there is no sign for disinfection per se. So yeah, and then I think you opened up with a very white uh, reflection about sunlight and these were the words that came up also on your word cloud is life and health and energy and even happiness and different words. Uh, then was this reflection on the first talk talking about daylight in different environments that it changes, I guess also for, for your research, depending on latitudes, uh, seasons, where we are. Um, You were talking about different ways of disinfection uh, of water and surfaces, about direct and, and non-direct, and which ones were more effective. Also, you've been talking about the effect of daylight on DNA and what happens when this, this is happening. Mm, there was a lot of, I heard a lot about COVID you know, and how uh, disinfection of surfaces and virus and how much time you need to disinfect a surface and which type of uh, disinfection was more uh, effective. I heard more about indirect, but you correct me if I'm wrong. We we're talking about germs and surfaces hospitals, how important is cleaning in hospitals, but it seems that it's not enough that we clean very often. So there's luckily other solutions that you were talking about, antimicrobial coating of surfaces um, that inactivates microorganisms, act, acts in a continuous way and it's autonomous and create a self-sanitizing effect mainly on hospitals, but then, yeah, I think you were explaining very well how it worked, um, how it worked with these dye molecules and on the surfaces. And also you were mentioning all the advantages of it. There were no health risk. It's something that works independently. It's sustainable and um, and it can be used for surfaces, not only on health um, locations. It can also be used in schools, supermarkets, elevators, common spaces, and door handles that are everywhere. <laughs> and then our last speaker was talking about treating patients with daylight. She was talking about photodynamic therapy how treating patients, and she was explaining this process on treating someone with cancer in like locally, 
using visible light and oxygen and, and the amazing effects for cancer, cancer healing. Oops, sorry. Wow, oh, sorry about that. Um, let me go there again. We were here, yeah. Yeah, also you mentioned a lot of different advantages. That is a technique that is not invasive, has no side effects, is, has a fast recovery, is repeatable, has a focused application, uh, no selection of photoresistance broad application spectrum and no inter interference with other uh, treat treatments or therapies. But also mentioned that there is still a lot of research needed for getting the desired results. And there were many costs of applying this. Um, you mentioned this person called Oscar Rabs that this his thesis and, and got this breakthrough. <laughs> Um, and different clinical examples that you apply this therapy for acne and for periodontitis and affect, infected diabetic food. Um, and the big potential of photodynamical therapy on uh, anti-cancer, antimicrobial regime. And it's something that we can apply when other treatments are, are not being successful. And I think that's what I got from all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you for so nicely summarizing and virtually harvesting uh, the key points. I think all the speakers saw, saw part of their key messages in a, in a graphical form on there. So with this, I would like to thank our speakers for the presentations and the discussion, Marina for the, the input on there. Uh, but I would, before I close, I would like to hand back the voice to our audience and close with the last question. So go to the Mentimeter again, please. And the question is in one word, how are you leaving this session? Just give us your impression, your feeling, how are you now leaving this after one and a half hours of this seminar? Have you learned something? Happy, that's the most perfect thing, excellent. Yeah, I hope that all the different views on different uh, on the different aspects gave you a bit more insight what light can do for you, can do for health, and that these technologies are in principle available, but they could be used more. And there is a lot of potential to um, use light uh, to improve our health. So I see we have. Uh, a good feedback now it's coming in the feedback from different different sites um, looks also positive like we started at the beginning so i'm very happy to see that we got our message across thank you very much for joining us here and with this i would like to say goodbye and hand over to lydia because lydia will just uh say the goodbye then thank you very much for joining from my side lydia all yours Exactly. Thank you, Burkhardt, and uh, thank you all of you for joining us and contributing with so many interesting questions to this discussion. And uh, of course, a big thank you to the speakers and to the moderator for this uh, extremely interesting and insightful session. And before definitely closing this webinar, I just want to let you know that the Daylight Awareness Week continues tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. We have two other great webinars coming and let me just share my screen to show you better. Here we are. So tomorrow, exactly. Tomorrow we have four fantastic specialists of chronobiology, circadian rhythms and sleep research who will explain us how the lack of daylight can affect us, can affect our health. And on Thursday, it will be our, the, the third and the last session. And uh, it will be a round table with six excellent speakers um, representing very different uh, disciplines or fields, ranging from urban design and uh, engineering to art and ecology. And the idea of this very interdisciplinary webinar is to discuss 
um, how all this scientific knowledge that we have about the, the benefits of daylight can be applied to make our cities and our uh, built environments healthy and sustainable. So a very interesting topic too. And if you haven't registered yet, the good news is you still can. You just have to go to the Daylight Academy website and you, you will find the, all information there. And of course, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to contact us. You have here the email address and uh, the, the website. So thank you so much again. Um, have a nice evening and uh, see you tomorrow. <laughs>